Brooklyn block. That's a promise. Watch me like a cam, cause it's my time. Make sure watch me like a cam, cause it's my time. Switch the can garment, especially side the Barclays. Spin between crosses, I can score with both hands. Many flawless, and I get to paint like an artist. I'm a bar smith, so you should respect my handle. I see the big picture with the nets like a mantle. In the future, I see us as Shamsu. And when we do, I'ma do a Brooklyn dance move. The third and call Millie Rock like a fan do. That's a bet like my parlay on FanDuel. B-R-O-O-K-L-Y-N. B-R-O-O-K-L-Y-N. choice every day what that looks like for you being steadfast keeping your nerve yo yeah we got the jack vaughn part in the song we gotta take that out of the song man but <laughs> <laughs> we really try to we really try to uh i work hard on that song man yo do you like that song dylan no that one's tough that one's tough yo do you think that song could ever be played in the barclays man oh i definitely think so if you if you Fix it up with the, the current coach team, all that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, nah, I appreciate you, man. Yo, I seen you. Um, I just wanted to say I seen your I seen your work um uh in the Kenny Anderson interview. Mm -hmm. I watched that, that was really good. Um, I seen him uh talk to talk to you about defense. Um and uh I also seen the uh, one with you and um, Pete. I watched that mm -hmm. one too. That was like one of my favorite episodes uh, from that fans, you know. So shout out to him. Um, but yeah, no, I seen your uh, your IG page too, man. Uh, it looked like you, you know what I mean. You've been a fan for a while, man. How long you been doing this? So I actually grew up in Jersey. I was born in '01, um, and ever since then, I've been watching. Uh, I say that I've been a Nets fan since 01. I truly have been. Um, I really started getting into basketball, though, and kind of studying the game and everything about it, uh, probably around 2010, 2011. So I was more of a casual fan growing up because, you know, at a young age, you're playing sports, not watching them much. So when I did get the chance to watch, it was the Nets, and that was very depressing. Um, but, you know, it... <laughs> So I, I would say, yeah, I've been a fan my entire life, been a real fan and, and, you know, person who's really looked in depth at team building, where the direction of the team's going, all that type of stuff since probably about 2010, 2011-ish. But it's funny, too, because what actually really got me into, into basketball was, uh, I want to say it was the 2011 NBA Finals. It was, what, LeBron and against the Thunder? Or was that the Spurs? It may have been the Spurs one. Um, but that was what really got me into basketball. So once that following season started, whatever it was, 2011 or 2012, that's when I really started watching the Nets and trying to watch as many games as possible per year. Oh, uh, yeah, no, I hear you. Um, I think being a Nets fan, you do see us go through a lot. And again, man, I would call it, I guess, the, the pre-cap to what was going to happen today. But that stream last night was legendary, man. That shit was funny <laughs> as hell, man. <laughs> So, so thanks for pulling up last night. Uh, that was that was that was dope. That was dope. Of course, man. Of course, definitely have to do um, some more in the future as well. Oh yeah, nah. I look forward to it. Um, oh man. Um, but everybody wants to know Clax. They said I was watching the game last night. They were saying that uh, Clax is getting if he got fourteen rebounds, he would have an average of double double. And I, I imagine that has something to do with him and contracts and negotiations and whatnot. He had 11 rebounds. So I know he's going to, uh, you know, try to raise his value going into the offseason. Um, Interesting. 
do you do you think that uh he he wants to stay here in, in your in your opinion from from what you, what you see it's tough because i i think it's going to really depend on I, that this question or this statement at least continues to come up is what direction will they choose right mm -hmm. you look at some of the players on the team if they choose to rebuild by dorian finney smith lonnie walker dennis smith mikhail cj right if they're looking yeah. to re uh in, to contend it's potentially out the door with Cam Thomas, uh, Dayron Sharp, Nick Claxton. So there's there's a big issue that they're facing, and they have to figure it. This, is, this was something I was hoping they'd figure out by the deadline, but they didn't. So we're now focusing on it in the offseason. It just got reported today, as you're already pulling up my page. Uh, yeah. Ben Simmons, they are not looking to buy him out as of right now. And that's coming from Brian Lewis from the NY Post. And if you remember Brian Lewis the past four years, he's been the voice of Sean Marks, whether it was Kyrie's issues, James Harden's issues, uh, mm -hmm. KD's trade request and how the Nets weren't going to trade him, even though, you know, Shams and all of them were saying uh, the Suns, the Celtics to offer Jalen Brown, all this stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. Brian Lewis has been the voice of Brooklyn the past four years. He said it this trade deadline, the Nets don't expect any big moves. Uh, the Nets aren't interested in giving up a first round pick for DeJounte Murray. They're probably yeah. just going to make minor moves and retool in the offseason. But, but, but that's what I'm saying. Like, I think a lot of it, again, remember last night we were talking about the difference between the GM assistant and the GM. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, Sean Marks, he's he's the one, uh, how you say, um, in charge of the contracts negotiating for play to free agency and stuff like that. So I'm saying mm -hmm. that to your point. Why not give up a first round for DeJounte Murray when – Oh, do you feel that confident in Schroeder? Is it because of that? Because I can't make logic of it because we got Royce O'Neal for a first-round pick, remember? Yep. We just got Royce O'Neal for a first-round pick. So if you're going to do that for Royce O'Neal, you could do that for DeJounte. You know what I mean? That's that's what I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, the biggest problem with Sean Marks and his entire tenure in Brooklyn, whether it be rebuilding from the start with no picks, uh, building a contender, and then losing that contender, is he has no uh, – he has no self-awareness of, of the urgency that's needed to continue running a page that are not a page. That's, that's me uh, running an organization that works. So there's been numerous occasions, Joe Harris, he could have gotten a first round pick for him back in 2020, 2021 refused mm -hmm. to do it. He could have gotten a first round pick um, for Bruce Brown, uh, Bruce Brown, if he felt that they weren't going to resign them, you know, mm -hmm. like there's so many players, Dorian Finney-Smith, he did get offered two first-round picks for. Mikal Bridges, he did get offered three or four first-round picks for. These are all players that he says no to as if they're the next LeBron James. And then ultimately, they tank and they lose their value. And then you trade them for, for pennies on the dollar. So this right. has been a, a, a reoccurring issue during the Sean Marks era. And it's not something that's seemed to be changing anytime soon, which is a big mm -hmm. problem if they want to pick a direction at some point. They're either going to lose the value of the amount of picks that they can get, or mm -hmm. they're going to have to overpay for a star. And that's just something that we're not in the, uh, like, like, like we're not in the situation to do that right now. So I don't yeah. know what's going on, but something has to happen this off season. Yeah. But again, it just, to me, all leads to Sean Marks and his decision-making as a GM and who we sign and don't sign and whether we mm -hmm. really, what direction we going. And again, I looked at the free agent market for the power forwards. We better off building with Noah Clowney. Better I mean, off in all honesty, yeah. There's not a conversation between them two. Yeah, this is one of the worst free agency classes you could have, not to mention we also don't have money to do it. So it doesn't even matter who's available. You get your MLE which is your mid-level exception, you get your league minimums, and you bring back one of your players. That's, that's really how free agency is going to work for us. So don't expect big moves. Like You you may see Claxton come back, Trendon Watford for about 8 to $10 million a year, Lonnie Walker gone, Dennis Smith Jr. gone, and then that's it. Like You may see like two league minimum players, but that's why I'm saying a lot of what the Nets are about to do needs to be through trades. It's kind of been the story of our franchise in its entirety, right? You don't get your great players through free agency for the most part. You got Kyrie and KD, you got lucky. But outside of that, what have you done? You've gotten Richard Jefferson through a trade. You've gotten Vince Carter through a trade. You've gotten uh, James Harden through a trade. So it's not like this is an organization that usually is in a position for free agency. Mm -hmm. So this is nothing new for them. But they have to figure out, like I keep saying, which direction are they going to ultimately choose? Is it the rebuilding route? Is it the, you know, oh, we're just going to sit here and retool again, which is was just bullshit for saying we're just trying to prevent re uh, rebuilding? Or are we going to contend? And 
in all honesty, there's no route that I see that they can contend without being pretenders. I just don't see them being better than Boston within the next four years. I don't see them being better than Philly in the next four years, uh, mm-hmm. Milwaukee, potentially even Miami. Like there's just Indiana, if they pick up one more star in, in the off season, like these they are, gotta, about they got to they gotta keep Siakam. And, and, on to, yeah, and, and to your point, again, did every team is going to become more competitive each season. But, again, my mm-hmm. thing is being a fan, one of my best times being a fan is seeing when Dinwiddie was here before he left and mm-hmm. seeing that call. And, again, I was saying this last night. As a fan, it felt good. I didn't feel like we could – win the championship that year. But the fact that we played that well that season gave me confidence as a fan that we building towards something. So I at least as a fan want to see that opposed to being the contender. Now I know that, again, microwave in the process don't work based on recent history because you can't duplicate uh, skill, can't, uh, can't equate chemistry. You know, mm-hmm. no matter how talented the player is, when who he's playing with his teammates, you can't, you can't, uh, uh, you know, say okay because of the skill we don't need chemistry. You still need chemistry. Um, I seen KD and Kyrie hang their heads low after they lost that first game with uh with um versus Boston. Mm-hmm. My thing is when when they lost that first game versus Boston, why y'all hanging your heads low? Like still, uh, that focused. is demoralizing. Stand like you, you should be focused for game two. Don't don't let that. It's because they just started playing with he not post. They just started being <laughs> teammates, and they ain't have a lot of games under their belt for them to. You know what I'm saying? Like hold a chin up. Like yo, we could get past this. You know what I mean? And I just think that matters. Well, and neither of them is also a true leader. That's why neither of them yeah, is a true leader. I mean, you you look at Kyrie's background. He's being led by Luka Doncic right now. He was being led by KD prior. He was being led by LeBron. He was being, you know, he was trying to be the leader in Boston and that didn't work out. So the Nets never had a true leader. KD's history. I mean, Russell Westbrook was really the glue of the OKC Thunder. It wasn't KD. Um, You know, they had him in Golden State. Steph Curry was the leader. Uh, You know, he came to Brooklyn. He tried to be the leader and wasn't good at it. It was like Kyrie in Boston. Uh, and now he's with Devin Booker. And, and I mean, if you've been watching Suns games this season, Katie's lost a step. He's done. Like, yeah, I love I love KD, but I had a, I is, had a Suns. I know I had a KD fan that used to come on this page and tell what you said. Once you mm-hmm. see, I guess, KD slowing down. He KD ain't pull is up 1000 slowing more. down. Yep, yeah. he's he's one thousand percent slowing down, and it's it sucks to see. But it also I'm a big LeBron guy, so it's it, it makes you actually you know. Makes you think like that's how important LeBron is. This man has is thirty nine years old in year twenty one, and he hasn't slowed down. He's averaging twenty five seven and eight. Like I it just that's incredible when you look at yeah. the age comparisons between him and KD. But this is this is a Nets podcast, not a not a LeBron group chat. So no, 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 we, we, we we talking ball, we talking ball. Um, again, uh, I was in a conversation earlier. I think yesterday. Um, shout out to Chill for Chill. He's basically saying LeBron's son could play, you know, uh, lock, be a lockdown defender, be kind of like a Pat Bell player. He won't be necessarily a player like his father, but that's mm-hmm. the kind of style of play that he will have. Um, and I said that, bringing it back to the Nets, that we kind of got that in Schroeder, and that's why we could look the other way with D, uh, with DSJ and um, shit, uh, Ben Simmons, for that yeah. matter. Like, now, realistically, regardless of they keeping him on the roster – um, I like what Kevin Ali did with the rotation. You know, I like that he started benching uh, uh DMP and Lonnie Walker, uh, uh, DSJ if necessary. And I like Cam Johnson coming off the bench. And the difference between Cam Johnson, uh, with Kevin Ali as the coach is him putting more pressure on the rim. In my opinion, I feel like Cam Johnson is a better player when he put pressure on the rim, when he becomes yeah. one dimensional and he just tries to just take all his attempt, attempts at the basket uh jumpers I, I think we we get the less of lesser of him um mm-hmm. seeing him aggressive is is fun to watch if he's going to be on this team he he I, I want him to to have a coach like uh Kevin Ali who has a reputation for developing players because I think uh he's still in a, a development mode he he's not somebody that's fully developing in his prime in my opinion um and this team needs um you know a development coach and i think we get that out of uh kevin ollie which you was mentioning last night 
Um, yeah. I remember that was the question of the panel. So, again, just speak to me how you feel about Kevin Ali and him uh, having a team next season. You want to see that or no? 1,000%. I think he is the guy that we've been looking for since replacing Kenny Atkinson. Uh, he is a great de de a developmental guy. I mean, he's done it in UConn, won a national championship there. He's done it in the G League the two years that he coached the G League Ignite, which is the, you know, the, the high schoolers that come out of uh, high school instead of going to college, they go to the G League. That's that team. So he's coached guys like Amen Thompson, Asura Thompson. He's done great with all of them. Um, so I don't know why we wouldn't want to rebuild especially like it's just it doesn't make sense to me how brooklyn has at least for next season ben simmons an expiring contract you know dennis schroeder uh, an expiring contract dorian finney smith who has some value and is a little bit older than what we need mikhail bridges who has gotten tons of, of interest whether it be sacramento houston uh the knicks you know the hawks even uh the grizzlies you know there's about 10 teams that have that have checked in with the nets on the Cal Bridges. Uh, same thing for Cam Johnson, minus the teams. But, you know, this is another guy that you could move off of. You know, you may take a loss for it, but it's a guy that you can move off of to continue a rebuild. You got guys like Nick Claxton, you know, Noah Clowney, Dayron Sharp, Cam Thomas, Jalen Wilson, Noah Clowney. Like, that. those are the guys that you need to build around as of right now. You have six guys with potential to build around, plus a, a head coach who can develop those guys into what they are. I mean – just from the moment Jacques Vaughn left to when yeah. Kevin Ali was hired, Cam Thomas yeah. immediately became a better playmaker. He started seeing the floor a little bit better. They started running you know, better plays. Noah Clowney mm -hmm. in his few games in the NBA, he has really shown that he can do it all, rebound, shoot, uh, you know, score within within the inside, play defense. Like he's done it all. So I don't see why I don't see why this organization isn't looking at every aspect of this team and seeing that every aspect leads towards a rebuild. Right. You yeah. have the assets. You have the assets in four years to begin a rebuild. Why would you why would you prolong that even more by trading those picks for a star and not actually contending? You're going to be a first or a second round exit no matter what. It doesn't matter if you add Luka Doncic and fucking LeBron James to this team this this upcoming <laughs> offseason. They're not going anywhere. It just doesn't work like that. So yeah, but my I, I I got to kind of agree with you, but I do mm -hmm. think it's fun to watch. I just wanted to add to the, you know, the six guys that you said that, um, you know, we should build around. I, I think this is the first time, like with Dayron Sharp, he's a mm -hmm. good uh, sub for uh, yeah. Clax. But no one thing Clowney, about Dayron, though, that I got to jump I, in for. But, but I think, but I hold on, I just want to say this. Clowney plays better with Clax, not just subbing for Clax, yes. but next to Clax. Um, well, I that's think, one of the issues that I'm saying. Do you contribute that to Kevin Ali too? I kind of, I kind of contribute that to one thousand percent, one thousand percent. Because him at UConn, he played two bigs as well, I believe, if I'm not mm. mistaken. So okay, did so he win he like that? that? He did the championship. Yeah, he won a national championship. Yeah, with the so, two bigs. I believe so. I'd have to well, double check the roster, okay. but I do think that it was like a like a stretch for. Mm. Um, let's see, Kevin Ali national championship team. But what I was going to say though about Dayron Sharp is. Yeah. There's already talks that I mean I had seen a report a while back. If you scroll down on my page, it may be there. Um, but there was something that I had saw that said Cam Thomas and Dayron Sharp have team options this year, whether it be okay. they get extended or they just get accepted and kept for one more year. From the likes of it, I'm hearing that Cam Thomas isn't getting a contract as of right now, and nor is Dayron Sharp. Now that was closer towards the trade deadline. Since then, Cam Thomas has truly improved. I yeah. do think that he is somebody that could get a contract this this offseason, if mm -hmm. not towards the trade deadline next year. But Dayron Sharp is a question mark. I truly believe that if Brooklyn is looking at gaining a star, Sharp mm -hmm. could be a part of the package, especially if they accept his team option. He is a one-year guy on, on a $4 million contract, I believe. A team would love that, especially knowing that they can extend him. So I would be cautious to see if Dayron Sharp is moved this offseason now that they know Noah Clowney is a guy that they could start and then come play off at the bench as well. And then you have Ben Simmons coming back who they love to play at center. Uh, so, you know, this is something that you could see in the near future. Dayron Sharp's also shown that he's been a little upset. It may be that one right there in the middle that says update for Cam Thomas and Dayron, unless if that's them coming back from injury. But 
Uh-huh. Yeah, that's for the injury report. Um, uh, Alpha, we'll find but, it. Yeah, but that that is something to keep an eye on because Dayron Sharp's name has been mentioned uh, as a potential you know trade candidate this off season. Yeah, you know, I, I'll be honest with you, I never looked at it like that until you said that. And mm-hmm. I did want them to, I wanted them to utilize Dayron, but just knowing the Nets and you know, again, trade them for for who and for what? You know what I'm saying? Because I mean, Dayron would like to see him on the trade a block, but for who star. and what? Though? For who and what? Dayron would likely be a part of a trade for a star. Mm. Like it would have to be like Dayron, uh, CJ, and potentially Schroeder or DFS. That would be so the package. You- so, so you don't think the twins got enough weight to say, "Yo, we need to play together no more." I mean, Sean Marks is the definition of a guy who gets bent over. So who knows, right? I, I mean, was, Joe uh, Harris did it with him. Joe Harris did it with him. Patty Mills did it with him. You know, I don't, I don't yeah. see how Mikal and CJ don't have a a different relationship with him either. The the guy just doesn't know when to put the foot down. So I'm not sure. I mean, if I was the GM, if I saw the way McCall played this year, if I saw the injury issues and, and the inconsistencies of Cam Johnson this year, I would definitely tell him to fuck off. And that, you know, so let me ask you, that I feel is necessary. So, 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 okay. So again, I'm saying this because this is my opinion, right? I, mm-hmm. I think, I think Jalen Wilson defense is better than CJ's defense. Easily. And it's not, it's not a question. Jalen Wilson is a is a three inch taller version of Josh Hart. It's exactly mm. who he is. Wow. Okay. So yeah, I've seen him be a strong rebounder too. I, I yep. thought that was yeah. I thought that was um nice to see somebody that um he's a guy he who could easily give you eight eight and four a game. Yeah, he stays player. with the play. He stays yep. with the play. If it's twenty four seconds on the shot clock, he's gonna give you twenty six seconds. Yep. You know what I'm saying. <laughs> Well, I, I, he's one of my favorite players to watch. I think Clowney. Um, so I'm I'm not I'm trying to guess the six players without you telling me. I got uh Clowney, Wilson, Cam Thomas, uh I'ma say, I'ma say, I'ma say Clax, mm-hmm. uh Trendon Wafit, and Dariq uh, Whitehead. And Dariq, okay, Dariq Whitehead. I don't know much about Dariq Whitehead. What's what's going on? What Dariq, Dariq Whitehead, Whitehead is I want to say he's what six six, six seven. Uh, he's dealt with injury history. So at Duke, he played a very limited amount of games because of a, of an injury. He missed, you know, a couple of uh, weeks to start the season in the G League uh, due to that injury. Yeah. I believe it was a foot surgery or a wrist right. surgery. Right, yeah, that's what it was. Um, shin. It was his shin. Yes. And then yeah. the wrist injury that he has now. Uh, actually, no, I think it was a wrist injury coming into the draft. It was a shin slash foot injury afterwards. Uh, once he got to the league. That's his most recent injury. But between those two injuries, he's missed time. When I looked at his tape, I mean, I'm a Duke fan, uh, and that has a, a very shitty background to it as well. I, uh, Like I said, I grew up in Jersey, so when Kyrie Irving committed to Duke, that's that was my team. Um, but, you know, I got to watch him for a couple of games. He reminds me a ton of, like, a Chris Middleton-type player, a guy who's going to find his spots. Uh, He's a little bit taller for a guard, but could also play the forward position. Uh, A good defender, solid two-way guy. So I think if he stays healthy, he's a great piece to have. But if I had to pick out of all these rookies, if there is one to be moved for Mm. a star, it would be him as of right now. Mm. But one thing I did want to mention, because we touched on the topic of uh, two big men in UConn, this is what their roster looked like. They had a 6'10 power forward, a 6'9 small forward, a 7-foot center. Another six seven shooting guard, a six uh, six ten uh, power forward, six nine power forward. There's not a guy on this team who's under six foot, and there is let's see one two three four five six seven eight nine of those guys are above six six. So he mm-hmm. definitely knows how to utilize bigger rosters. He doesn't like the small ball bullshit that the NBA has been trying to push for years, which I have also said for the last seven years does not work. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a good thing to see, and especially now seeing him play Noah with Dayron and Noah with Clax. That's definitely a step in the right direction. I hope that kind of opens up Sean Marks' eyes. But like I've said this whole time, I don't think that you can pay Nick Claxton if he's going to be your second, third highest pl- uh, player next to Ben Simmons and Cam Johnson, right? Mm-hmm. I don't mind if it's just Ben Simmons for a year because you can get rid of him for you know and get all your money back. But right. at least Cam Johnson has to go. Right, I agree. I, I got no pushback on Cam Johnson. Got to go. I pause or mm-hmm. whatever. I, I, I totally agree. Um, two things. Um, 
Nets fans, you know, says Breezy, tell Dylan BK over New Jersey. I don't know what he's. I think I seen something about you and him going back and forth about Jersey and Brooklyn. Um, but hold on, you were saying about Noah Clowney, right? I was, yes. And and again, I, I think okay, that's what I wanted to say. The 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 common thread, in my opinion, should be that the GM Sean Marks seen two bigs win in. David Robinson and Tim Duncan. Even if you didn't see David Robinson that much, you've seen Tim Duncan. You know what I mean? And yeah. you, as an assistant coach, seen them win a championship. I if mean, even Kevin if you look at Miami in the early 2010s, it was it was Chris Anderson and Chris Bosh. <laughs> well, like, but look, if if but his personal experience, because he was an assistant coach at the time when they won it. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? With the Spurs, Sean Mark seen this with his own eyes. He's seen a championship come to the NBA because of two bigs. If another championship happened because your head coach won it with two bigs, doesn't yep. it make logic? Isn't it logic to have Clowney and, and Clax? It sounds right. Clowney and Clax don't it go together? Clax yep. and Clowney, Clowney and Clax, like have them on the same team hooping together, and we can we'll be a better team. I, I, hold on, the fans, the fans in the chat, they said, "What up, Breezy?" Um, love the content. Um, bum the season is two games from being over, but let's look forward to a better 2024 20. I mean, 24 25 season. Um, so crazy TV. He said, What's up, Breezy? Shout out to Jay. That's Jay right there. He, he said, What's, Hi, what's going on, Jay? Um, he said, It just goes again. He said, It just goes again. Oh, Clax and Clowny, <laughs> man. Clax and Clowny. Um, I think again, if you're gonna pay Joe Harris, you got to pay Nick Claxton. You're going to pay Cam Johnson. Yeah. You got to play Nick Claxton. Because when you think about yeah. who's the better Brooklyn Nets player, it's Claxton over Joe Harris and Cam Johnson. So how are you not going to pay Clax but pay them? That's that's yeah. pressure. You yeah, I mean, it, it's a tough decision because you have to look at it from the financial standpoint. If they truly believe, you know, and this is an organization that has just made worse and worse mistakes as the years go on. Um, you know, if they feel that Cam Johnson can stay healthy, that Ben Simmons can get back to his peak, that they could gain another star, you know, Claxton's a guy that they feel may be replaceable. And I don't see how I don't want that to be the case. I've said it multiple times. I don't mind them letting him go. If he's going to be the third, second paid guy on the team, like I wouldn't do that, but I also wouldn't be afraid to re-sign him and try and move those guys who are paid more than him, just because you have to figure out what you want to do with the franchise. And like I said, this keeps coming down to the same question. What direction will they go in this offseason? They continue uh, which, to push What it. you want to see? But, but, and I want to see the rebuild. Do, they, they, yeah, yeah. Okay, talk to me. What I want to see the rebuild. Like for, for, uh, next, for Dylan. Talk to me. Next so, so I've never been a person, and for anybody that's followed me long, long term, you would know that I am the biggest person that's against rebuilding. I absolutely fucking hate the idea of watching my team suck and be a bottom feeder for the next two, three years. It's a horrible feeling, but it's also something that organizations understand are needed sometimes, right? Look at Boston when they lost KG, Paul Pierce, Rondo. They went through a little bit of, of tough times, but they also got very lucky by getting our picks, right? They didn't have to worry about years of poverty because they also had our years of poverty. So they were able to rebuild quick. That's the same situation that we could have just had if we moved McCall to Houston. We had the opportunity to get a top nine pick this season. We had an opportunity to potentially rebuild and have a top five pick next year. Like mm -hmm. that would have been a quick rebuild, right? Imagine this team adding, say we add Stefan Castle, the six, six guard out of UConn, right? And then in, in this year's draft and next year, adding a guy like Ace Bailey or Cooper flag, if you somehow get the number one or number two overall pick. Like, hey, hold on, hold on. You got to slow it down, Dylan, because I'm even me. I don't know all of these college players, man. I, I hear their okay. names and I know they ringing bells. But yep. again, I don't know what they actually bring to the game. Do they put pressure on the rim? Is because of their jump? So, so Stefan Castle is a 6'6 six, six guard. He can do it all. He's a two way guy. Reminds mm -hmm. me a ton of like a Jalen Brown, but with better handle. Oh, uh, wow. So I, I absolutely love him as a player, not to mention he has the UConn fit. So it's a guy that, you know, Kevin Ali would absolutely love to rebuild a ramp. Um, Cooper Flagg and Ace Bailey, these two are coming out of high school actually this year and going into the NBA. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah. going into the in, into college. Cooper okay. Flagg's going to Duke. Uh, Ace Bailey's going to Rutgers with Dylan Harper, who is another top three player in this class. Dylan Harper's actually a Jersey kid. 
six six guard. Uh, but Ace Bailey is widely recommended to be the next Kawhi Leonard. That's his, you know, play Emma? style. Yeah. Yep. Cooper Flag is generational talent. This is the next one Binyama of the draft. He's six foot nine. Uh, he has KD's scoring and 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 you know handle. He has Giannis's athleticism and defense. Uh, this kid is generational. So he is widely recommended to be the number one overall pick, the consensus number one overall pick as of right now. Um, so like I said, if you can gain Stefan Castle in this year's draft or a guy like Nikola Tofic, who is, uh, you know, a six, 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 seven guard out of Serbia, I believe. Um, mm. But he plays exactly like Luca. So this is something that I don't, see why Brooklyn would not want to do. They have the opportunity to get the 2024 pick back and they have the opportunity to work a way to get 2025 or 2026 back. Like I keep saying, if you're rebuilding, I don't give a shit who, what, who the player is. I don't care about Jalen Green. I don't care about Cam Whitmore. You could give me Steven Adams and Jeff Green who are both 30 plus years old and expiring contracts after this season. And I'd be okay with it as long as you can get that 2024 and 2025 pick back. Like I've said, though, with a rebuild, you don't have a pick in 2024 at all. You don't have a pick in 2026 at all. You're really banking on Phoenix to be dog shit in 2025, which I don't see happening. Um, hmm. So so realistically, why would you not try and grab those two picks back, making your rebuild much easier? Potentially risking not having a pick in 2026 is fine, unless if you can flip the, uh, Dorian Finney smith or Cam Johnson for a pick in that year. Which is possible. Mm. So that's yeah, why I'm saying possible. it's so easy to replenish the, the the two years worth of picks that we don't have. Because what that would do is set us up to have our full rebuild done by when the 2027 picks start for Phoenix, uh, Philly, and ours again. Right? Mm. Yeah. That would be the most ideal situation possible. Because all that does is, is it clears us to rebuild sooner. We get that done by 2026, 2027. Those 2027 picks start, and if we've already garnished two guys throughout the draft, plus Cam Thomas, Nick Claxton, Noah Clowney turning into stars, now you have the opportunity to trade those 2027 picks hmm. and, and beyond for a superstar. Now you have the opportunity where you have 2027 through 2035, hmm. right? So you now have your eight years worth of picks, kind of like right now. We have 2024 through 2030. Or mm -hmm. so yeah, every six years. So you'd have 2027 through 2033, right? Mm -hmm. That gives you a much wider range. That's okay after you've already gotten your core players and your and your up and coming stars. That's okay to start star hunting again because you know you have something going. But Hold when you're on, looking... just, just to make sure I'm on the same page as you, first off, Sama mm -hmm. said, dude's a great listen. He said Breezy needs to bring him uh more often. <laughs> Appreciate um, that, Samba. Um, it does it sound like Jalen Wilson could take CJ minutes and Noah Clowney taking Dayron Sharp minutes going into next season. That's some of what we're saying. No, what I'm saying more so is if, if they decide to trade them, of course they can, but everybody knows sports is politics as well. You're not going to play a guy who's making league minimum or a rookie contract <laughs> over a guy making 20 25 million. It's not possible. It's, hello, Drew really 23. Isn't. Drew23 said, let's fire Sean Marks and hire Dylan as the GM. <laughs> Listen, man, if you guys love this type of stuff, I'm telling you right now, feel free to go shoot me a follow on Instagram. It's just at Nets Press. Um, yep. I do rebuilding content all the time. So you guys will see my comments either screaming at me or telling me the same thing, hire me. It's so funny to see it, how, how split people are about it. But there's truly ways to do this if they just got mm -hmm. off of their asses and did it. And I think yeah. it's possible only if they kind of commit to it. But they didn't commit to it at the trade deadline. They aren't mm -hmm. committing to it currently. And it's just, it is not a fun you know, Listen, there. listen, I'm, I'm going to say this. I'm going to say this, right? Um, Because um, I seen your, I seen your avatar, right? Your avatar, you you holding up the next spin. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, one, and then the other one, you got the game. You play the game, right? You play the game as in? Like any game, in just the game. Like, all right, so what I mean is, as in with the – let me tell you what I'm talking about. The game is as in as in being a GM, like dealing with mm -hmm. trades and this and that. So let me explain. Okay. I, but when I used to play back – when I used to play, like, on a regular basis, I used to draft my team on basketball and football. And yeah. I would draft my – yo, I was the – I was an incredible GM. Now, I'm not saying – 
it's easy. I was making it in the game that it should be that simple for the GM in real life. But you kind of do want to see, like, come on, how you ain't do that? That's that's easy work. Like, you see what I'm saying? Like, I, yeah. I critique the GM too because um, I think it's fun being a GM playing a game, but I know it's not the same magnitude as real life. But I think if no. he, he does better, he can improve the team, especially if he listens to Kevin Ali. Do you think they have a relationship? Do you think that this offseason, or again, Claw Smith in the comments disagreeing with us? He said that um we should pick a coach in the offseason, as in he not with Kevin Ali. Um, you think the Nets are sold on Kevin Ali, or you think they might go in a different direction? Like I said, it really you can't answer a single question right now until they figure out what direction they're going in. If they want to contend, by all means, I love the, the fit with Mike Budenholzer. I do. Um well, I also you got love a question. the idea. You got a question too, Budenholzer. I got you. I, I you're just getting a lot of questions in the chat. Now I knew this was going to happen. <laughs> I knew this was going to happen. Shout the quest one. He said, "Question for Dylan: What's the next obsession with star hunting when most of the top teams built their core through the draft?" Because Brooklyn, the Nets specifically, have this idea in their mind that you can't rebuild in New York, or it'll be financial suicide. The problem is. They've already put themselves in financial suicide in the aspect that no real fans are really going to the game, right? 25, 30% of that crowd is, is Nets fans. The rest of them are tourists and opposing teams fans. So when they talk about financial suicide, there's no way in hell that that, that Barclays Center won't be filled every single night because they're going to find random people off of the street to go ahead and go to games. So mm. that's just a bullshit excuse for them to say that they're just going to keep trying to contend because it makes the fans happy. Even though, in all honesty, if they listen to their fans, about 70% of them as of right now would say, we want to rebuild, mm -hmm. right? I mean, if you looked at my content from the beginning of the season on my Instagram page to now, you would see how much my comments and my own views have changed. That's mm -hmm. what happens. You're supposed to go, you're supposed to look at things based on how things are going, not how you want things to go, right? They right. wanted Mikal Bridges to be an all-star. They wanted Cam Johnson to be a 20-plus point per game scorer. They wanted Nick Claxton to be a defensive player of the year. They wanted Ben Simmons to be back at all-star form. None of that shit happened, right? right. Mikal didn't make an all-star game. He actually averaged the second most points on the team for the season. He couldn't even get first, right? Mm. His defense dropped off. Cam Johnson, injury prone, inconsistent. Right. Ben Simmons, back surgery again. Uh, mm -hmm. Nick Claxton struggled this year. If you really look at it, like – this was a year that we all thought he was going to take a leap. He was going to start shooting threes. He was going to start, you know, he was going to have that chip on his shoulder to be the defensive Ooh, player. Hold on, Claxton? Claxton, yes. No, no, I, no. no. Really I ain't never said, hold on, hold on. I was agreeing with everything up until that. Yeah, if I, you I, really nah, look at his defensive I didn't, stats, I didn't he was think not he was going to shoot year. threes. I, I didn't, I, um, Dylan. I didn't think that he was going to shoot threes. But I thought there I, was a world where he started doing it at least once a game. Hold on. But what I will say is, again, it, it, just so y'all know, you know, we professionals. You know what I'm saying? We professionals. For one, you know what I mean? Now, I'm joking, but I'm serious. I really knew that the part of the reason why Clax wasn't ascending is because they wasn't running a pick and roll with him. Ben Simmons wouldn't do it. He only picked. you never seen him roll. He not roll on no – he don't roll on the butter. They don't roll on nothing, man. So case in point is when Schroeder came, Schroeder and Cam Thomas, when they started rolling pick and rolls with Schroeder and, and, and Clax or Cam Thomas and Clax – that's when you see his office pick up. In my opinion, I think he should take 10 attempts at the basket a game. If he's not getting 10 attempts at the basket, we ain't putting enough pressure on the rim. The biggest Hold issue on. with that, though, is you can't have a big Look man. Jay, 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 Jay just threat. joined the panel. Dylan, Dylan, Jay just joined the panel. Oh, uh, what word? Jay, you there? Uh, I thought Jay was there. My fault. Go ahead, <laughs> Dylan. Oh, yeah, no, like I'm, I'm happy. happy. <laughs> Was good, bro. Uh, no, but, we keep out. Yeah. Um, but like I was saying with Clax, you can't rely on a big man whose only aspect to offense is dunking, is lobbing, right? You can't just be a lob threat. This isn't this isn't 2013 with DeAndre Jordan. We saw how his times passed, right? You got to mm. develop a mid range. You got to develop a corner three, right? So you have to have these aspects to your game to improve offensively. That's why I'm saying. I don't see where his improvements were this 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 season, right? He was kind of average on offense. His 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 rebounding struggled certain games. He was either a guy who put up 11, 12 rebounds a game or had like six. Like mm. he wasn't consistent rebounding and he's and he still has not fixed the problem, which is he can't guard 
all-star caliber big men. I, he's got by himself, no. Like, with with no, Clowney, he's, yes. But by himself, no. No, but I, I mean, think I, hold on. So with, in that in that championship year, would you say that Kevin Ali was a good coach on the defensive side of the ball? Championship year, one would have. Kevin I mean, Ali was, was, was no. I was talking about when he was in. Oh, at like UConn. Oh, yeah. UConn. Oh, yeah. He was he was incredible at UConn. That was a team yeah. that was not supposed to be past like the round of thirty two for March Madness, and they ended up wow. winning the entire championship. They so were the okay. underdog wow. of that. Yeah, was they, were, they were the underdog that year. Yep. Wow, it was right, similar right. to last year's UConn team. They weren't supposed to make it to a championship either last year, and they ended up winning the whole thing, and they just repeated this year. So they I, they they know how to I do it. I was listening to you guys. I was listening to you guys. I'm driving around for work right now, and we mm-hmm. got to stop saying we need to take Dayron minutes, man. Dayron, nah, he like, said he, he might been, be in a trade package, man. He's talking about taking I was minutes. Say, I he love Dayron. Yeah. All, I, together. I, I all I love I'm Dayron. saying is, he is obviously the best rebounder on this team. And with, with Claxton and Clowney on the floor. And like I said, we got to see Claxton and Clowney together y- yesterday. We never get to see Dayron and uh, Nick together on the floor. That could be a monster yeah. combo. It that, just would I never mean, happen. I could mm. agree with that if Claxton knew how to shoot the ball. Mm. But Dayron can shoot the can. ball a little bit. No, he, can shoot like, he, he could shoot at like a 20% clip. That's not a thing, though. You can't do but that in no, game. No, no, hold on, hold on, Jay. Go ahead. Put answer how Dayron will fit with Clax because we could see uh Noah being the stretch four is the reason why mm-hmm. he fits with Clax. So his how defense is Dayron also at the same far as Clax. I've been saying if we could have our best shot blocker and our best rebounder on the floor at the same time, that could mm-hmm. be something good. The fact that Claxton and Clowney both do a lot of the same stuff, so it looked like having two of them on the floor. But if you had the best shot blocker and the best rebounder, I think that would be good. But like I said, we would have to see it for it to work because everybody is quick to say it won't work, which is I get why it won't work, but what about if it does do something good? We've never seen it over these past two, three years. And hey, Claxton, I gotta I gotta break like something to, to you guys. Quickly. I got to break something to you guys. This just got posted. Macal Bridges reveals who he would want as a future teammate. If you guys want to listen in. Oh, you got some breaking news, Dylan? Yo, Dylan got breaking news. Did y'all do the RIP to OJ for breaking news, man? Oh, nah. Yo, rest in peace, OJ, man. OJ Simpson. Pretty much much this is Josh Hart and Macal Bridges sitting down having a conversation, right? It says, "Who would you want as a as a teammate again?" Mikael Bridges answered, "Josh Hart." Let the rumors oh. begin, boys. All I'm gonna yeah, say is, I do. There we again. go. Nah, uh, it, it be it be getting. Hold on, rest in peace, OJ Simpson. And Mikael Bridges it be, is the, walking into the, it. At this the point. rumors begin when he was the second. He was the second guest on their podcast. He was there before players on their own team. That's nasty work. Let's so see. I also- and, and, and the funny part is, is the link to the video was posted by Mikael Bridges' Instagram, and it's been deleted already. The video is already gone. Bro, the season not even over. This is disrespectful. We play the Knicks tomorrow. Yep. Yo, come on. He been disrespecting us with the Knicks all season long, bro. Come on, man. Hey, when he came here, he said, I love to play in the garden while he was in the Barclays. They giving him the best teammate award, but he acting like, oh, he a, no- a nominee. But they he make it seem like he he, he chose who his favorite teammates was already. Cam Johnson. No, that's wild. That, that shit was just bo- posted two minutes ago. Two minutes ago with the link and literally already been deleted. That's some crazy shit. Wow. Yeah. Single-handedly, Macal is single-handedly like showing signs. Oh, that's all right. Net, net, Brooklyn Netcast got the video. So here. Damn, you Brooklyn Netcast is faster than a motherfucker. Oh. Yep, this, <laughs> this is from a Chipotle ad that he posted 18 minutes ago. Would you ever want me as a teammate again? The card says, and Macau says yes. Wow! So, there you have it. Damn, they making commercials? Just, Come on, just yo. yesterday, we said, "Oh, I got nowhere to be." Look, it's a good thing for Brooklyn. Come on, we're gonna be back next year. I knew we didn't do what y'all wanted, but we we'll, we could fight next year. 
and now this shit. He was that, stuttering well, I'm, when I'm he said right it. Now, that, I, that he was, was stuttering when he night. said it. That was pathetic last night. I even tweeted about that. That was 1,000% the front office telling him to go out there and reassure our fans. That yeah, was I, a scumbag move on Joe Sy's part. He is an absolute <laughs> fucking pussy. Joe, Joe, Joe. I fucking Dylan. hate Joe Sy. <laughs> Joe Sy is a bitch. So who you think should have did it? Yo. Joe Sy should have walked on that floor. It. It was Joe Sy should have walked on that floor and said, this is it. my fault. We'll figure it out. Joe Sy needs to grow uh-huh. a sack instead of worrying about his businesses in fucking China. If he was so worried about that, he should fucking go back. He's a piece of shit. I absolutely hate that guy. Fuck him. I understand. I understand. <laughs> Yo, hold on. On that note, again, it, it's about being attentive to what is happening. Because if it's just about business, you're losing money. Again, the, I only said that to say somebody like Mikhail Bridges don't even want the role. I've seen a podcast with him and Paul, Paul George. Before the season even started, they said Brooklyn Nets gave you the keys, even though Cam Thomas is cooking. How you feel about that, Mikhail Bridges? He was like, <laughs> uh, well, yeah, you know, Cam Thomas is tough before. He was like, yo, Paul George said he gave y'all 40. He said, oh, yeah, he, he did give us 40. Like, yo, man, you've been hating since then. Mikhail yo. Bridges isn't meant to be in this position. Nah, he tried right? to pretend like. He he not that I think that's more what it is. It's not that he he's a guy that wants food. to just have fun and do what he loves. Can't hate right. him for that. But right, he it's don't not it's not meant to be he here. Don't want, uh, he don't want Cam none of that. Thomas won it. He won Cam Thomas right? won it. Clarkson Cam Thomas won. wants to be the guy that hits the game winner. Cam Thomas wants to be the guy that's gonna go out there and you know win games for people. Yeah. I agree with that. So yeah. Claxton, Claxton want to be here because of the whole everything. He liked the fashion. He liked the I was gonna world. Say, Clax likes fashion. He wants to get the little rundown pictures every game that he yep. posts. Yo, Clax. Clax he want to be I here, like though. You can at least say Claxton want to be here. Bridges just showed us that he don't want to be here. I, I would not say Claxton That shit hurt, here, bro. Yeah. I ain't going to hold you. You don't want Brooklyn. You don't love us? <laughs> oh, man. All right, Bridges. Listen, I will say I, I'm not 100% sold on Claxton coming back. I'm not. Mm. Memphis can make small moves to clear up like the cap Josh. space. Him and Josh. Yep. He, he, well, well, he's from South Carolina. Yeah, him so and Josh being close. Friend. Yep. Being close in that area, Ja being a friend, them being a contender next year. Not to mention the fact that they could potentially get him without giving up a dime while also. So they would still the have Triple J and him? They would have Triple J, Claxton, and a top seven pick this year in the draft. <sighs> And what we get? Nothing. Fuck all. We get dick. We get nothing. What do you mean? We have cap space. We're screwed. Like so, you saying we gotta saying. sign like, and trade them? You either have to figure out a way to, out of respect, you, I do think Claxton would say, "I will sign." Nothing. Yeah, I do think out of respect, Claxton would agree to that. I do think so. I don't think he's that much of a dick, and I think he does know that they've tried to keep him for as long as possible. If he feels that he's better off elsewhere, I do think that he will give the Nets the benefit of the doubt. But when you're looking at it, I do see this as more so a 60% chance of him leaving compared to a 40% chance of him staying because his decision is solely going to be on what do they do this offseason. Do we reset and do I actually have to look at my future on this team as when's the next time am I going to compete when I'm 29, 30 years old and that's going to be me on the trade block next? Or are we going to try and contend now and you know, am I going to be the centerpiece to a defense? That's what he's going to really be prioritizing this offseason. So if right. he feels that they're going to you know, screw him over down the line or if they're going to undervalue him or if they're going to rebuild, he may not want to be a part of that. He may look so at a team think, like Memphis you or, or OKC. Hold on, you saying want to be on a contending team? 1,000%. Who, who don't want to be on a contending he, team? He was already – he, he got a taste of being on a contending team with Kyrie and KD, right? Right. And he, that's what, he, well, that's what his, his, his media attention was elevated at, at his peak. So imagine what that's going to be like on a team who can contend for multiple years to come with a team right, so, that has an organization that actually can keep stars happy, right? So, so what, what about the sign and trade? What will we get back in the sign and trade? Hypothetically. Sign, now, sign I'm just trade. saying, I'm saying it from a standpoint where I want to keep class. Let me just put that Sign and trades are hypothetically lose, lose situations, right? You're going to gain the player, but you're also going to give up a little bit. You're not going to get the full value of the player, though. So for Claxton, I would say Luke Kennard and their first round pick this year. That's it. That ain't enough for Claxton, man. Listen, a top seven pick, you can. I, I'd take that. But you don't I think they're trying to keep Claxton happy with the clothing line? Like, come on, bro. Like, we we trying. 
We yeah, try. We've also tried things with we've also tried things with other stars, and then they get traded the next week. Nah, Kyrie Irving, they didn't try with Kyrie. I, Jay was saying something like that about KD, though. Like, yo, why they don't do little things that you know, uh, kind of cater to to the stars? You know, I, I heard that in the Dallas, they giving Kyrie uh, a personal chef. I seen I seen Kyrie eating a banana on the, on the side. Well, you- well, you do have to try and figure out any way possible to keep bipolar people happy. So, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, Kyrie <laughs> is one of the most bipolar fucks I've ever met. If people people who actually know me knew that my page was a, originally a Kyrie page, not many people know about this, actually. I oh, started okay. that page Break as a Kyrie news. Irving page. And the reason for it is because I was in high school. I was playing sports. I had no time to cover the Nets. So I wanted to do something where I can at least, you know, do something that I love, which is create content. Which is also, I gained probably about 15 of my 19,000 followers just from that, right? Yeah. I had Kyrie following me. I have DMs with Kyrie. I actually yeah. was supposed to work for him at one point, but that relationship went south after he started all his bullshit because wow. I was very vocal about it. So this is a guy that truly is your- bipolar. <laughs> yeah, this dude is truly bipolar. I mean, he followed me, right? He yeah. unfollowed me because I posted him in a Lakers jersey and said, do you think Kyrie will join the Lakers? He joined our group chat, which he's been in for years, and said, if I see one more jersey swap, you're getting unfollowed. Just like that. And two days before that, he was posting and talking about free agency. He's like, yeah, I don't know what I'm going to do. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm weighing in my options. Super cool about it. Media started going at him about it. And then he flipped on us. So it's very funny to see his bipolarness i've I've single-handedly seen it in person so it's you know catering to stars i get it but that's not catering that's just trying to keep a dude who can't keep himself together happy what what about k what about kd now again this is what i want to say about quote-unquote keeping stars happy i don't like the fact that they thought it was cool to switch the coach Kenny Atkinson, and let me say why I like Kenny Atkinson. A lot of people say, oh, they like Kenny Atkinson, but let's get to the why. Kenny Atkinson uh, will sit a star down. I seen him sit D-Lo down because he wasn't playing the defensive side of the ball. I seen mm-hmm. Kenny A- Atkinson switch up the uh, who who was going to get the ball that night based on who had the hot hand. There was nice carries, carry Yo, breathe, on the breathe. offensive not, side of the ball. Not, there, but I'm then there was a nice fix that, y'all. I'm, listen to y'all. I'm out. All right. All right. Shout, shout, shout out to Jay. Good 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 conversation. Shout out to y'all. I'm listening to y'all, though. I just had to come up and say something. But shout yeah. to y'all. <laughs> yeah, now nah, I appreciate you, Jay. Um, And again, I think – that's why we all miss uh, a Kenny Atkinson because of his defensive principles. When I looked at the roster of the rankings that year, we was the eleventh in defense. Mm-hmm. We we ain't, we wasn't close to that. We was we couldn't sniff that. You know what I'm saying? Like we was in tw- ranked twentieth. I think we got closest we got uh, uh, to top ten was fifteenth. Yeah. Um, but I, I see some of that in Kenny Atkinson. He he got something called kills. Um, kills is, is three stops in a row. He said, you know, when we, when the team could go out there and they could get kills, then, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? That's where we get momentum and it starts on the defensive side of the ball. So he preaches defense. Now, Claw Smith is in the chat saying, um, you know what I'm saying? Uh, Budenhauser, and you were saying that, then we got to the questions in the chat, but you were saying something about Budenhauser too. So you think maybe... Buddha House may get the green light over uh, Kevin Ali in an offseason. I mean, if I'm personally looking at the coaching uh, situation, there is about seven candidates that you could actually look at if you are truly interested in contending. You got the assistant coach on the Celtics, Charles Lee, who is by far my favorite up and coming coach that's coming out of this potential offseason of coaching candidates. I but think that a, that a many, hold on. How many of us don't know about Charles Lee, including me? So can you just tell okay. us who Charles Lee is? So, so Charles Lee has been an assistant coach for both the Bucks and for the Celtics now. Um I mean, I'll just pull up his information real quickly. Yeah, I'm he gonna do was, it too. I'm gonna put it on he the was, screen. He was a former former player for the Celtics, actually. He was a six three guard. Um, so he has the experience. He has mm-hmm. coached with the let's see, he's coached with the Bucks. Assistant for the Celtics, uh, let's see, an assistant for the Bucks from 2018 to 2023. So he was there during their championship 
their their fake championship, I should say. Uh, mm. And then he was the assistant for the Atlanta Hawks from 2014 to 2018. So mm. this is a guy who's had an assistant coaching experience for now 10 years. Um, and he's widely known around the league as the best assistant coach in the league. So he's up for head coaching positions. He's, an, he's a guy that um, has been rumored around the league for many teams as their next head coach fit. Another guy who's been quietly climbing the rankings is – Jared Dudley, assistant coach for the okay. Dallas Mavericks and former Brooklyn Net. Um, mm, I can see that. He is, he is a guy that is getting rave reviews uh, around the league as an assistant coach. Mm. So there are no. I've seen I've seen an interview players. with him, and he was talking like that. He's on the um. He you say he's working with uh, Jason Kidd right now, right? Yep. But he was really vocal with the Nets too. I remember him getting into it with players and and. and you know, it was like, oh, Jared Dudley talking shit, but he used to fight for us. <laughs> yep. He wasn't he wasn't the best player, but he used to fight for us, man. He 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 was a a, a great net. Yeah, I won't yeah. say he was a great player, but he was a great Nets player. You know what I mean? Definitely. I mean, and just just from this little page here that's showing potential head coaches available, you got Mike Budenholzer, uh, Budenholzer, uh, Terry Stotts, Mark Jackson, Kenny Atkinson, Nate McMillan, Becky Hammond, Stan Van Gundy, Jeff Van Gundy, Mike D'Antoni, Dwayne Casey, uh, mm. Stephen Silas, James Barago, who was the he, he was the assistant coach for the Charlotte Hornets, mm. um, Charles Lee, Jared Dudley. Like there are tons of names out there. Yo, but now I'm 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 gonna be honest with you, Ness Press. You got me with with Jared Dudley. They used to call him the junkyard dog, junky yard dog, for his mm -hmm. toughness and nose for the ball. And he I reminded would love Jared me of a, a tough as a, as a, coach. Yeah, yeah no, nah, I man. would love him as an assistant, not a head right. coach just yet. Just not yet. just I do yeah, think he has not potential too early, to do too it. Soon. Yeah, but he's more of a guy that you want to hype up your players to you know do the dirty work to be that guy in the locker room who's going to chew you out and scream scream at you, be loud. Like that's not meant to be your head coach for the most part. You don't right. see that on the sidelines from a head coach much, but from a guy who has the respect that Jared Dudley has, who has the pull with players around the league that could bring guys in. I mm. think he would be a great assistant coach with Kevin Ali. And then if you brought in a guy like Charles Lee or, you know, Mike Budenholzer as your head coach, I think right there, that's an incredible coaching staff that you could build for, for a contender. But again, it just depends on what moves they make. If they move Cam Thomas, uh, you know, for Donovan Mitchell, that's pretty much trading fucking a hundred dollar bill with, with with five twenty dollar bills, it's the same shit, just different years and younger. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. so yeah. I don't I don't but, know what direction they go. It's that's the biggest question the whole time. Right, right. Um, again, as far as direction is concerned, I heard you say. I just want to bring it back to what you said. I don't know how much time you got, but I just want to say thank you, thank you for your time, thank you for pulling up. Of course, man. Of um, course. Uh, Nick Claxton, and again, this is this is my my debate with you, uh, or fans that feel like we we should go another place. Now, these are the free agents. Now, I don't have no trade machines or situations that I could think of that mm -hmm. you know what I mean we could do. But this is who will be available, um, going into next season. You got Valanciunas, Rashad Holmes, Wiseman. Those are the three players that's above Nick Claxton. Now, mm -hmm. Valanciunas is getting fifteen mil. So if we if we was going to get him over Clax, how much are we paying him? How much are we? Well, paying the only him? reason why they're above him right now is because of the salary that they had this year. Mm -hmm. James Wiseman's likely going to get less than what he got, or the same contract. Where John Holmes is going to be on a league minimum. Jonas Valanciunas is probably going to get less because he's getting older. He's also probably not mm -hmm. going to be on the Pelicans anymore. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, when you're looking at teams that could have interest in Clax, and it's going to be the Pelicans, it's going to be the the Thunder, it's going to be. Uh, the Grizzlies, right? These are teams that are in need of a younger, more athletic big man. So, yeah, I, I see. I see there being a competition. Yeah, but that's for him. the it's thing. Just that's the thing, Dylan. Every every a lot of teams look at us and be interested in taking players off our team. We we see that, but what what do we get back? So my thing is when I look at the availability of what's the competition for Clax. That's what I'm saying. Even if y'all saying, "All right, cool, y'all don't want Clax," all right, then hold it. Because Clax yeah. looking like one of the better players on this list. Oh, 1,000%. There's no reason that the Nets shouldn't look to bring him back. And real quickly, though, I got to touch on a comment here. Irvin, do you know how to use non-uppercase? Just a question. Because you're saying? killing me with this. 
This oh. man is having an entire temper tantrum down here. <laughs> oh no, 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 no. That's him. That all of his uh comments is like that. That's yeah. all that's all that's all his my, comments. My, my inner Twitter trolls trying to come out right now and fuck with this guy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Oh, weird. I see him. He trolling you. Yo, Irby K, you the only one that said that, man. The, the, the fans love him, man. Shout out to Des Press, man. I'm glad he pulled up, man. Shout out to you, Irby K. But Des Press, we cook it all, all, whole stream. We are our in. Hopefully, y'all hit seen something. Y'all like it. Hit the like button. If when you like something, hit the like button. Um, mm -hmm. Claude, Claude Smith says, if the Nets wants to do the continuity thing, Ali should be resigned. A new coach yep. will want a new coaching staff. We sure as hell will be starting from scratch then. Um, to your point, Claude Smith, yeah, we got forehand Kelly, Jason Weaver, Scott Burrell, who just got the promotion from the Long Island Nets. The coaching staff that we got, some of those guys you uh, you want to keep. So I wouldn't want to start there as well. I would rather go with Kevin Ali I, just from here. I don't think Mark Jackson is reality. The guys I don't think Mark Jackson's good either. Yeah, I I think the I think the uh I don't think he's reality. Um, I think I think the uh guys you mentioned, I like Jared Dudley, but to your point, yeah, I think he would be better at, on the staff, but not the head coach. Um, I, I, I just think when I'm all right, do you watch the post game interviews in press? I mean, Dylan, try to, but the issue is, is I don't have cable, I'm, I'm in college, so I'm in a dorm, so I watch the streams, and usually they cut off beforehand, so I kind of have to watch them afterwards when they're posted on Twitter. All right, so that's why that's why I got the uh post game uh where he said the three kills i got that from watching his post game interview um mm -hmm. listening to him in a post game interview it speaks volumes he, he's very articulate he's very to the point he's you know i know we lost this game and it, you know you know what we got to blame the coaching staff too you know very accountable um never 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 holds his head down he takes everything he faces all the music and mm -hmm. I think that um, you need a guy like that where you could go back to the locker room and say, yo, guys, I handle this, but we got this. You understand what I'm saying? Opposed to, you know, you, you imagine you listening to the coach and the coach. You heard what Jock Vaughn said? I don't know if you heard it because you said you don't hear it. He's the post game interviews. He said, um, oh, man, I wish I could have rallied the guys like the coach in Cleveland. You know what I mean? He's a great guy. Like, I should ask him what he said to his guys. Like, you don't mm -hmm. do that. You know what I'm saying? And there, there was countless examples where you could see Jock Vaughn didn't have the locker room. And I'm saying that to say in the rebuild, you want to go with a player who, like you said, proven himself. You know, that's nothing to sneeze at. He worked with our men and I saw Thompson, like, yeah. right before he got here. And so it just shows that he has success with young talent. So I just think we, you know, we expand on that, man. Paul. Yeah, I definitely think that the, there's no reason not to, like, there's no reason to bring in a new coach. You've done this four times in four years. Figure it the fuck out. Clearly, you picking new coaches doesn't work. Stick with the guy who's actually doing half decent. Wins well, don't correlate to what a coach is. Seeing the improvements of the players is what does. And so far, we've seen that Cam Thomas has improved. Noah Clowney has improved. You know, that's all you can ask for at this moment in time your two youngest players who you have the potential to build around are doing their best let it be there's no reason yeah. to, to there's no reason to go after anybody this season and it answers Irvin's question again no mark jackson's fucking awful there's a reason why he's not coaching still there's a reason why he's been out of a job for the last six seven years not a good coach oh uh, I, I don't know man i didn't see a lot of him but from what i've seen i would have to kind of disagree man I, I think he's kind of the reason why clay thompson and the curry was together um it just them how you say being a, a duo the way they were but again like i said i really follow the nets like i watch 82 games in a row um but Mark Jackson and the Ghost State Warriors, I can't say that I watched them. I just know from their success. So I don't really want to debate that in a sense because I, I don't know enough to say. But um, So I won't debate it. But hold on. A-Train has a question for you. He says, Dylan, question for you. If the Clippers get bounced in the first round, could Brooklyn try to get Paul George off the Clips? Don't resign him because I know they signed Kawhi, but not George. Um, No, not a chance. I love Paul George, actually. He's one of my favorite players in the league and has been for a really long time. Um, I would have loved this five years ago, but no, he's not looking at Brooklyn. He's looking at Philadelphia and he's looking at Indiana. So, and, and if I had to take a guess right now, yes, he is leaving the Clippers if they don't make a finals. So mm. I would expect him to be back in Indiana 
or with Philly. And right now, Philly seems to be the front runner. They have the cap space. Tobias Harris is going to be a free agent, which clears up $36 million for them. They have a couple of other guys who are clearing up a cap salary for them. So be ready for Paul George to Philadelphia. That's what I'm calling right now. Damn. Yo, you really know your off-season stuff, man. I ain't going to hold you, you know what I mean? I'm not going to um, lie, dude. Yo, I'm not even going to lie. I actually enjoy the off-season more than the season sometimes. I'm not even going to lie. There's so much <laughs> cool shit that goes on that you can actually read into and figure out. It, it's so fun, man. The last three years, I've really been just – I'm even doing it with the NFL right now with with, uh, with the draft coming up next week or in two weeks. I just It's so fun to do the off-season stuff because these are the things that you – like that you don't get to see during the season. So um, the off season kind of keeps you alive while, while there's no games being played. Did, did you follow the summer league? I, I watched a few of the games. Uh, I was actually working full time at the time. So I really didn't have the time to watch everything in depth. Um, mm-hmm. I had I probably had watched two out of the six games. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, that's between where we picked Noah Clowney at 20 and his G league performances, that's what actually had made me not believe in him at first. I thought it was a reach for a pick, but I mean, he's proven me wrong, so I can't complain. Didn't get to see Jareek Whitehead. Um, and I, but you just pulled up on the screen now actually is what I'm making a post for now. So if it, if, if it sounds like I'm not listening, I am, but I am also making the post for, nah, for that you, right you, now. You, you um, always work with a gift. Follow his IG. He's 18,000 trying to get to 20,000. I'm a fan of his page. I, Definitely peruse through the through the page. Um, this is Dennis Schroeder. He says wants to call Brooklyn home. Uh, but at the end of the day, of course, I want to stay here. I met Joe Sider, owner, his wife, his kid, met his family, said hi, probably kissed the baby. He said, and of course, I want to build something special here. Of course, he, does that sound like McCall Bridges? No. Then he says, everything they say, I'm preaching the same thing, and I'm the same player that they're looking for. I'm the guy, not Ben Simmons. Huh? Out with him in with me. Yo, he tough. It, it, then he says, and it would be great to stay for sure. From from Mr. From Lewis. Then you say you spoke to dude. This is guy you talking about. I you personally haven't spoken to him, but he is the most reliable guy as of right now. The past few years, like I said, with the KD situation, Kyrie situation, Harden situation, DeJounte Murray rumors, mm-hmm. um, you know, certain people resigning. He's been the voice of Sean Marks. So, yes, he is by far the most credible person that you could ha- get information from when it comes to the Nets. As mm-hmm. of right now, it used to be Brian Winhurst. He was the guy that could just predict right. fucking anything. Um, but, yeah, I would say Brian Lewis is by far the most reliable at the moment. So if he's saying that, I'd expect Dennis Schroeder in Brooklyn next year. But at the same time, Nick Claxton, or uh, I'm sorry, uh, Spencer Dinwiddie said that last year. You know, if yeah, they feel that you know, he's not in the picture, you know what's then, then he'll about, be gone. You know what's interesting about that is that um, I just think that Spence is business savvy. And, you know, again, I listen to your content. I, I listen to the interview with you and Spencer Dinwiddie. Again, mm-hmm. you, fans, go check that out. Next Press, he got an interview with Spencer Dinwiddie. I was listening to it. I was like amazed. Like, wow, how do you even get this interview? Um, And Spence, he was straight to the point about a lot of the stuff that you were asking and I, I love that interview, but it, I could tell that he knows the business. The part yeah. where he was discussing the contracts and all of that stuff like that, you know, real business savvy, but he was glazing, you know, saying what he was supposed to say, talking about Cam Johnson and Mikhail Bridges. Come on, man. He didn't even mention Cam Thomas when he was talking yeah. about well, what the team needs and this and that. I was like, damn, bro. And then – uh. I seen him get into it with Cam Thomas when he played the Lakers. Um, Cam Thomas looked like he was mad that Spence was following him, and they was going at it. Did you see that? I did actually. Yeah, they. They, they I mean, listen, when you're playing a former team, of course you're going to try and get under the skin. And Spencer Dinwiddie has every right to talk now. He's actually on a team that's going to be in the playoffs. So mm. you know, <laughs> yeah, it's sad you know, it's, you know that Cam Thomas wanted to go to the Lakers as a rookie. When he got drafted. Everybody wants to go. Anybody who loved Kobe as a kid wanted to be a Laker. Look at Tatum. I'm telling you right now, Tatum's the next one up. After he gets extended this year in Boston, he'll probably mm-hmm. be a Laker by the time he's 30 and that team starts to slowly wind down. Because, I mean, you got Al Horford who's going to be retiring soon. Drew Holiday just signed his last contract in the NBA. Porzingis mm-hmm. is getting a little bit older with his injury history. Jalen Brown may, be not, may not be on the team within the next three years just because of his cap hit. 
So there's definitely a world where where Tatum is gone within the next six years. I could see that. Oh, you don't think he retires as a Celtic? No. Nah. Wow. Yo, man, Dylan, this is a great interview, man. Like, seriously, like, <laughs> um, I think that's that's interesting, you know, him being someone that we could have sought after if we would have kept our draft picks. But I understand the business of it. You know, you want to get familiar faces to, so the people with the fans to come out instead of rebuild as soon as you get the team. Um, but, it, you know, you see how that happened or how yeah. that played out, rather. Um but him not retiring as a Celtic, to me, I, I think it's a shame. Sometimes I think some players should never leave. You know, I was saying that KD should have went back. He should have said, yo, you know, I was wrong. But I don't think OKC won him now. You know, yeah. I, I thought he should have went back. But after he left Brooklyn, like, because I don't know if he retires a son. You know what I'm saying? But um, bringing it back to the to the Nets, am I over-exaggerating when I say I want to see Cam Thomas retire a Brooklyn Nets? Is that even possible? <laughs> it's possible if they make it possible if they show him that he's the key then yes if not he's bouncing the moment he can and the crazy part is the lakers are going to be the first ones knocking on the door most likely just knowing the fact that lebron's going to be gone within the next two years uh you know if they don't find a guy like trey young or donovan mitchell to pair with anthony davis anthony davis mm -hmm. will be gone within the next two three years so they're going to be starting around that like lonzo brandon ingram kyle kuzma era type basketball where they're rebuilding like that so i could see cam thomas going over there of course he loves that damn. damn i hope he stays yo i just want to say shout out to the next kingdom because they caught that content that you was talking about with uh macau bridges they they caught it too you mean Word. New York Nick McCall? Exactly. I just had it, man. Where's that, man? I can't believe this guy, man. He was just lying to the whole arena last night. Yo, that's crazy, bro. <laughs> Listen, man, I'm not finna end this show off of that, man. Listen, what I, what I will say is this, man. I think that it is it's a lot of uncertainty and going into the offseason and dylan uh being one of the better uh offseason offseason content creators I, I would definitely love to have you back so that we could uh discuss the possibilities because yeah i think as much as i love the next team i think in the offseason they're one of the most unpredictable teams uh i've ever seen you know what i'm saying um that being said I, I do want to see the rebuild more than I want to see a star hunt. And I think that's what's best for the Nets. You know what I mean? Uh, and hold on. Before we go, what happened with you and uh, Nets fans you know about Brooklyn and Jersey? What, what happened? You don't want the Nets in Jersey? I mean, in Brooklyn? No, no, no. I'm, I'm a Jersey guy, so I've always said that they should move back to Jersey. Hold on. All right. So just, let, me, let me try to unite us because I always I, – I don't like this between the Jersey – in the Brooklyn and us not getting along about them moving again, you know, at first and first and foremost, this is all about business. And I'm contrasting the next in the conversations just to say that it's about location. And because of Penn station being connected to the garden, that is a lot of the success of fans coming to see the games and watch the games. And that's the same thing we tried to replicate and having the Barclays connected to Atlantic Avenue for the, business purposes so that's why it's here in brooklyn you don't have to look at it like you are lost that is the wrong choice of words the jersey fans did not lose the nets to brooklyn we are one together as family <laughs> you know what I'm saying <laughs> Nets fans united so i just want to say that but Again, from well, here's my thing with that. Right? From Jersey, how how you feel about it? That's how I feel because we spread love in Brooklyn, so we don't look at yeah. it that way. So, how how you feel? No, I don't. I don't. I don't think the move to Brooklyn was the bad part. I think it's the lack of Brooklyn's organization and their demeanor that has kind of pushed away the New Jersey culture. I mean, if you look at you know the past few years, they've done nothing to replicate Jersey. They've done nothing to show their respects to the Jason Kidd, Vince Carter eras in Jersey. They don't even like to show the front of the jerseys for the most part, um, pictures mm -hmm. if they post them. So there's a big disrespect towards New Jersey. And I think Nets fans don't understand. They like to kind of go with the, oh, well, it was a poverty franchise. Fans weren't showing up. That's bullshit, right? You have a team that sucked so bad 
that people actually <laughs> wouldn't go to the games. But the Nets as a whole, that's been their entire franchise for the most part. You've, we've been to Long Island. We've been to Newark. We were in another state. What was it? Izod and Prudential. We were in Brooklyn. Like, we've never had a place to call home for more than 15 years. So, no, you can't build a true fan base in, in 10 years. That's never how that works, especially New Jersey, which it was also in a shit location. Being from New Jersey, nobody wants to go to the shithole of Newark. Nobody wants to have their car jacked, potentially. I'm sorry, but that's the yeah, truth. Dude. Newark but is no, a but that's fucking what I'm dog shit the, location. But that's what I'm saying about the location. Um, mm-hmm. The ball place being where it is, you don't think that just for the fans – access to even to reach there you know you don't think that's the best we've we've done no i think it's actually the worst i mean if you're it, it's the best for people in new york it's, it's, it's the best for the people in the city what about the jersey but, guys that take the path train on wall, on wall yeah but if you, yeah but if you're train. really looking at it if you got fans in upstate new york or rockland county new york or if you got fans that are in in jersey and they want to drive there you're already looking at forty dollars in tolls there and back. You're already looking at forty dollars in parking. You're already looking at if you're a family of four going to Nets games, you're looking at one hundred and sixty dollars to two hundred dollars in tickets. You're looking at about another two hundred in food. It shouldn't cost that fucking much to go to a game. When in reality, when we went to Newark, it was like six dollars in tolls. It was like twenty for parking, and it was like forty for tickets. It was nothing. You could actually go to a game for less than two hundred dollars as a family. You're going there as a family now. That shit's like six fifty, seven fifty. It's fucked up. So that's why so, people from Jersey don't like it as much. We just don't like the drive. We don't like the traffic. We don't like the fucking tolls and the expenses. It's just not worth it to us. That's why I've been very limited in the games that I go to now. I I so this is the last part of the show. Um, but I, we we agree on most things, uh, and that's pr- pretty much. I, I was hoping we agreed on the coach because I, I I'm a mm-hmm. big fan of um Kevin Ollie. Um, no. all right, so I just want to say, uh, I want to show y'all this real quick. I, I just want to show y'all this, and again, I really think that the Nets are gonna be in Brooklyn forever. I, I, I do mm-hmm. now. Look, the, the Nets started at the T Neck Armory, mm-hmm. right? T Neck Armory in 1967 and 68, they were there for one year. The capacity of, the, of being there, uh, all the fans that could be there was 3,500 people. It was in T Neck, New Jersey, right? Mm-hmm. T the, the T Neck Armory. This is how it looked. Look, look at this, man. You, you're going to play <laughs> basketball in there, man. Come on, man. This look wild, man. It's a tank out front, it's two tanks out front. You trying to tell me that's fan friendly? Come on, man. All right, all right, so then we played in the Long Island Arena from 1968 to 1969. The capacity was 6,500 in Comac, New York. How the hell are you even going to get there? Like, I'm from New York, but I don't know where Comac is at. I was going to say, you know I couldn't even tell you where the fuck that is. Listen, somebody just said <laughs> that I've never been to IZOD. I could show you guys pictures right now of me chilling with Brooke Lopez and Courtney Lee at their basketball Yo. camps. I've been to Prudential Center. I actually sat courtside at IZOD because of how shit we were. It was during the 12 and 70 season. So I never want to hear the fake fan bullshit ever again because I quite literally have pictures, tickets saved, uh, mm. autographs, pictures with family of me at those games. So if you don't believe it, that's on you. But like I mentioned to you before, Irvin, learn how to type in lowercase. It actually makes you look more knowledgeable. You just look right. like somebody who's screaming. Right, right. Irvin K, relax, man. <laughs> Just relax. Irvin, uh, uh, um, Dylan Big Cooking, all stream, man. I then we played at the Island Garden. What is, did you play? It looked like your race horse is in, in there or something. What is that? Bucks. Uh, uh 5,200 <laughs> people, West Hempstead, New York. I heard of it. Heard it was a place in New York called West Hempstead. Never been there myself. They was there for three years. Nassau Coliseum, 1972. I wasn't even born. 1972 to 1977. Capacity, 15,200. This is kind of that's kind of better than what it was. That's a step up right there. You know what I'm saying? Location, Uniondale, New York. I've heard of Uniondale, but I've actually never been. Um, let's see. Let's see. Rutgers Athletic Center from 1977 <laughs> to 1981. 9,000 people. Now, oh, and I was reading the book called Right. I, I was reading a book called uh, T-Neck the Brooklyn about the Nets, and they used to call this Pisca- Dataway to Piscataway. 
That's what they used <laughs> to say when you wish to go to Nets games. Um, what was the announcer that passed away like two years ago? He was the announcer for forever. Oh, oh my goodness, you. I forgot his name. I'm gonna get his name. I'm gonna I'm be back. If we do me and Dilly do another stream, that next stream we do, I'm gonna I'm gonna have his name. I don't want to run off and get the book. This is the last part of the show. Um, yeah. shout to Dylan. Thanks for pulling up. Um, hold on, hold on. Uh, and again, the eyes are our center. Just, just cause Irving K said that, please just Dylan, just, just give us a, a eyes are our center story. Just any game, one game, uh, just one quarter, just a play when you would see Brooke Lopez, just, just, just talk to him real quick. Just when I'm trying to play with your Nets fan handle, man, please talk to him. <laughs> well, one of the first memories that I have, uh, of, of the eyes on center was Vince Carter. Actually, he, he played there between Oh four and Oh nine. Uh, so let's see. Uh, it was either Oh eight or, or, or 10. Um, and it was right before he had left. So I was either like seven or eight years old. Um, mm. my family was able to get me seats towards the Nets like tunnel. Yeah. Um, and after the game, actually Vince Carter had tossed me up a towel. And wow, I that's was a, that's out. I was like, holy shit! Like this is like because at the time, <laughs> at the time, he was my favorite player. Now, if I look back on it, Jason Kidd was by far my favorite player. But okay. um, it's so funny because you think that's cool and all, but the next day I come home from school and my mom threw it out accidentally because she didn't know it was that one. So, oh, oh. but I you was there. You threw for that. Flesh. I have nothing you to show for there. it. But I, yeah. yeah, I remember sitting in the little corner by the tunnel. Vince Carter came over, gave me a high five, gave me the towel, and that, and that was it. Because back then, I mean, what was it, 2008, 2009, you weren't, you know, pulling out a phone to take pictures immediately. So I don't have anything to show for it other than a picture of me with a little bit of face paint on for uh, for like a Nets logo. I was probably, like, like I said, eight or nine years old. And... No, nah, let's let's uh, hold on, holding no, up Dylan. towards courtside with the Nets practicing. No, Dylan, let's 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 try to put some let's try to put some um some motion behind this and and try to get uh tweet Vince Carter, tweet him, and and then mm -hmm. let him know like you met him one day. Maybe we could get an interview or, or tweet back or something. You know what I mean? <laughs> Vince is one of the toughest people to get a hold of. I'm not gonna lie, I've tried before. Uh, okay, I reached out to Kenny Anderson. He he responded. I reached out to Spence. He responded. Um, it's funny. I actually started a TikTok not too long ago, but I don't really use it. I can't fucking stand that up just like Twitter. Um, but like the first post that I put up on there, Richard Jefferson liked. So I was going to try and see if I could figure out a way to get him on something at one point. But other than that, there's not really much that I could do. Brooke Lopez doesn't answer shit. I'd love to have him on there. He's one of my favorite nuts of all time. Um, but other than that, yeah, I mean, as of right now, my podcast isn't really going anywhere because like I said, I'm in college, so I don't have the setup to do it um, consistently. Well, nah, you could join but, us, man. You know, like we be chilling. No, nah, definitely. Hold on, hold on. So, so Irvin K, put some respect on on Dylan Hand, fit Nets fan handle. Gave you a whole story of how you met Vince Carter. Which shout to him because he's in the Hall of Fame now. Mm -hmm. Um, shout to him, big shout to Vince Carter for being in the Hall of Fame. And when he was here, man, he was amazing. Um, air amazing, man. Finn Sandy. All right, but that's the eyes are center, and it looks like the Nets played there majority. They played there for what it looked like 29 years, 29 seasons. That's that's a lot. Yeah, that's yep. that's a lot. Um, Prudential Center, two years. Uh so it's actually funny. Yeah. I was in class on Monday and we had a presenter come in. I'm not sure if you know the name Chris Bra. Uh um, he's yeah. actually He's he was a sponsorship salesman and one of the higher ups for the Nets. Okay. Uh, between oh five oh oh no oh seven and twenty fifteen, and he said it was funny. They were actually supposed to move to Brooklyn in two thousand ten. The reason they went to Prudential Center is because they had licensing issues. Uh, because this one singular person that lived in the building that w is where Barclays is, uh, is currently wouldn't leave so like he, he was telling a story when you would drive past barclays or what would have been barclays at the time there was an entire apartment unit all the lights were blacked out because they had paid everybody to move out except for this one fucking guy who wouldn't leave so eventually they had to pay him way more than they paid the rest of the people and that's how they were able to get their rights to move to brooklyn 
and and you know take down that building. But that that's the reason that why they went to Prudential is because they were supposed to go there in 2010, their final season at Izod was supposed to be their final season in Jersey, but they couldn't mm. figure out a way to get the building up because the guy wouldn't move out. That makes a lot of sense. That's why I was such a shortstop, but from 2010 mm-hmm. to 2012, because it's yep. it, it, that would make sense because it's only two seasons. Like, why would you for only two seasons? You know what I mean? Um, yeah. but all the other ones, again, when I read about it, it was when it was like one season, it was because of the way it was like, you see the two tanks in front of there, you can't play there. Then another one was like an ice skating rink and the boards kept getting wet. So they couldn't play there. So there was a lot of reasons why they couldn't play in a lot of places. And, but I never heard that story until you said that. So thank you for that. Yeah. Of um, course. What's going on with your boy Irwin here though? I think he's having a little bit of an aneurysm. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, First of he, all, I'm not a, he, yo, I'm not a, he, I'm not a Giants or a Jets fan, but either way, they're from New Jersey, so suck mm-hmm. it. I am a Devils fan, suck it. I don't care. Uh, and I am a Pittsburgh Steelers fan, so guess what? I got six Super Bowl rings, bitch. Your team doesn't. Yeah, yeah hold on, hold on. And last but not <laughs> least, uh, the Barclays Center, 2012 to present. That's mm-hmm. that's a good to get. That's that's we we need more. We need more. Um, 17,732 fans could fit in this Barclays Center, uh, in Brooklyn, New York. Now, I think we stay here, man. It's no reason to leave here and leave here and go where you know what I mean. Like, th- this is obvious the best option. They're not gonna do all of that, ask people to move out and pay them extra and all of that just to get here and then leave here. Um, we missed the playoffs this year, but it ain't enough for us to skip skip town. Um, I don't I don't see anything in the near future for me to even worry that we're gonna leave. I think that the Brooklyn, I think it got. I like the way it sounds too. The Brooklyn now, New Jersey sound good. I'm not saying that it don't sound good, but I like Brooklyn, man. I'm from Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. It, it 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 got a ring to it. Uh, hopefully we get a ring one day. Cause I'm with you on that, wanting us to get a ring. Let's not be happy with having zero rings. Like we fans with zero rings. We, you know what I mean. Everything should be about what's happening now. We can't even, you know what I mean. Like the finals yeah. is nice, but no, that's not the same as actually winning the NBA championship. So, yeah, I hope we hopefully we stay in Brooklyn. Oh God! You got Knicks fans joining the chat too. Jesus Christ! <laughs> yeah, shout. I know him in real life, man. He funny as hell. Shout out to Jack City, man. Yo, man, this is this is a net fan podcast, man. I just wanted to remind you of that. Uh, shout to Jack City, though. Shout to all of the whole chat. Shout to Dylan for pulling up. This is this episode got wild at the end, but it's all love, man. But Jack City, just remember this. Nets fans are the best fans. Um, before you go, you wanna you got any playoff predictions you want to say, or you or you? Or you oh man, I, I'd I'd have to look at the seating. I mean, if if if, if the seating is the way that it is currently, you gotta in the come East, back then, bro. You gotta you gotta come back then. We'll, we'll definitely come back for when the matchups are ready because I I love doing those predictions. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, let's, they let's they so that. close. They so I think the only thing that I did see was the first round the Clippers play the Suns. Yeah, I mean, if I had to give predictions right now, if the seeding was to stay the same, I mean, for the playing in the East, it would be Philly versus Atlanta, Miami mm. versus Chicago. Give me, give me Philly and Miami. Mm. So you would have Philly against the Bucks, Miami against the Celtics. Give me the Celtics in five. Mm. Give me, honestly, give me the 76ers in six mm. over, over, over Milwaukee. Milwaukee. Over, over Milwaukee. Milwaukee? Mm. Give okay, me, healthy Joel and B. Healthy Joel yep. and B. Yep. I hate to say it, but give me the Knicks in seven against the Pacers. And give me the Cavs in six against the Magic. So that would leave you with, let's see, the Bucks, or I'm sorry, the, the, the Celtics going up against, I don't even know how that would work. You'd have Boston. Right. Knicks, I'm Cavs. confused. You would, yeah, you would have Boston, Boston, Knicks, Cavs, and 76ers in the semifinals. Depending on the matchup, I would take Boston no matter what, and then I would I, I would I would think it's Philly versus the Knicks. Give me Philly. Mm. I think it would I think it would be Philly going up against the Celtics in the fi- in the conference finals. I don't see the Knicks making it now that Julius Randle's hurt, and then of course give me Boston go to the finals. If you're looking at the West, 
Suns I mean, versus shit. the you're, Clippers. Man. Shit, That's your tough. your ninth seed in the West could make the finals. That's some crazy shit. But I mean, realistically, for the plane, it would be what seven versus ten. Suns versus Warriors. Give me the Suns. Kings versus Lakers. Give me the Lakers. So that would put the Lakers at the eight seed against the Nuggets, hmm. and that would put the Suns at the seven seed against the Timberwolves. Uh, I would say, I would say, give me. Give me Nuggets and six against the Lakers, and I hate saying that because I want to see LeBron win one more. Um, but give me the Nuggets and six. I think I think the Lakers are done. Uh, Timberwolves yeah. against the Suns. Give me the Timberwolves in seven. Hmm. OKC versus New Orleans at this point in time. Give me, give me OKC in six, and then Clippers versus Mavs. Give me Mavs in seven. Mm. Um, who else would that be? So we would have Denver, Minnesota, OKC, Dallas. Mm. I I would say, I would say out of that, depending on matchup, the the conference finals would be OKC versus Dallas. Damn, that's a hell of a prediction. We're gonna be back to see the actual how it actually plays out. But I'm mad we ain't in it. But I am going to follow the playoffs. I am going to, you know, I, we won't, you know, we'll have it in the background, probably just have all the games on or something like that. Um, I'm not following no one team. But, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, no, I, I, I'm going a, I'm to a follow it. Uh, that's what, as soon as next week, I think the playoffs, the last game the Brooklyn Nets play, we play the Knicks tomorrow. And then we play, I think, the 76ers on Sunday. And yeah, that's it's the not going to be a fun end of the season. Yeah, yeah, and that's the last, the last of the season. So, yeah, I, I'm gonna do the recaps for those two games. But um, when uh, you know, me and Dylan, we will next time we'll link, we'll you know post this so y'all have a you know uh, be to the attention ahead of time, uh, maybe mm-hmm. two three days in advance or something like that. Um, but yeah, man, that's that's all I got, man. You want to say anything else on the closeout, Dylan? Nah, man, I appreciate you for having me on as always. Uh, we'll definitely figure out a time to get back on, maybe even tomorrow night. We'll, we'll see if I can get on to the, to the recap. If not, I'll try and get on for Philly. What is that, Sunday at 1? That could have potential, but most likely tomorrow. But um, I appreciate you for having me on as always. Uh, at the end of the day, let's go Nets, and let's hope that they figure their shit out this offseason. Yeah, facts, man. Nets fans is the best fans. Thank you all for tuning in. Uh, like, share, comment, subscribe. Peace, y'all. Don't lose your shit with this group. Being tougher as a group.